Okay, let's warm up. We've got these inequalities and we want to graph them on a number line. We've got x is greater than negative four. So we find negative four on this number line, put a circle there to mark the spot. Now we wanna leave the circle open because we wanna be greater than. So we don't wanna actually equal negative four. So this open circle represents getting infinitely close to it, but not actually touching it. Then we want the greater than, so we will draw an arrow going this side. Next, x is less than or equal to seven. So we find seven here. And this time we can close the circle. We can equal seven and be less than. And so less than would be this side. Last example here is negative two is less than x. So we find negative two, open circle here, and six is greater than or equal to x. So on this side, we've got a closed circle. On the other side, we've got an open circle. And we wanna draw, draw a line in between the two to represent all the points in between. This is graphing and solving linear inequalities. It's 9.1 in our textbook. Let's review writing the equation of a line. A very handy skill that we will definitely need. So the first and most common is probably slope y-intercept form, y equals mx plus b. What do you need? Well, you need the slope, which is m, and you need the y-intercept, which is b. Slope point form, very useful. Uh, y minus y1. Now this y is the variable and this y1 represents the y value of a point that you know. The m is still the slope, same as up here, and the x is our variable and x1 is the x value of a point that we're using. So we need a slope and a point for that. Slope formula, m for slope, is equal to y1 minus y2 divided by x1 minus x2. Now, I wrote it like this. It really doesn't matter if you put y2 minus y1 and x2 minus x1. Just these have to be lined up. And what do you need? Well, you need just two points. So example one here, let's practice this. Let's write the equation of a line that passes through two negative six and one three. Well, no matter what form of the equation we're going to use here, we need the slope. So let's start by finding that. And what will be our first y value? Well, let's just use this one here. So negative 6 minus the other y value, 3. And make sure these are lined up. So the 2 goes with the negative 6, and the 1 goes with the 3. And this is negative nine over one, and we wouldn't leave it like that. We don't like unnecessary things like divided by one here. So we will just write that as negative nine. Now, what do we have? Well, we have a point. Actually, we have two points and we don't have the y-intercept. And so let's use slope y-intercept form of our linear equation. Now, which point should we use? Well, let's give it a try with the first one here. So y is our variable, so we leave it as y. And then y1 will be this one here, negative six. Now minus negative six just really becomes plus six. Our slope, which we just calculated here is negative nine. And our x value of this point is two. And so we're done. That is the equation of a line that passes through those two points. There's nothing we need to do to it. We don't need to put it into y equals mx plus b form, or slope y-intercept form. This is good enough since the, since the question doesn't specify. We could do it the, using the other point. There's no reason why we had to use this point. So let's try it using this one three point. y minus three equals negative nine x minus one, and although these two equations look different, they actually represent the same line. When we're working with inequalities, we follow the same algebra rules as we've always done with an equation or an equality, except when we multiply 
and, or divide by a negative number. So using a simple example, let's see what happens when we do that. First, let's try multiplying by a positive number. So 10 is obviously greater than 8, and we just made up this simple example to see what will happen. Let's multiply both sides of this inequality by a positive number, like 2. Now on this side, 10 times 2 is 20, and on this side, 8 times 2 is 16. So 20 is obviously greater than 16. And so nothing changed. You can see that we started with greater than, and we finished with greater than. So nothing happens when we multiply by a positive number. Let's try multiplying by a negative number, like uh, negative 2. And this time we've got negative 20 on this side and negative 16 on this side. Now, which one of these are larger? Well, negative 16 is actually larger. It's closer to zero. This one's further away, further down, if you will. So you see that when we multiply by a negative number, we started off with greater than and we finish with negative 20 is less than. So when we multiply by a negative number or divide by a negative number, we need to flip the inequality. If it was greater than, it flips to less than. If it was greater than or equal to, it flips to less than or equal to. Now what happens to the inequality when we add or subtract the same number from each side? So we could also use our simple example here and test that out. You can always test out these rules if you forget them using a simple example. So 10 is obviously greater than 8. Let's try adding a positive number here. So 12 and 10 and 12 is definitely greater than 10. You see that we started off with and finished with greater than. So nothing changes. What about uh, subtracting a number though? So 10 is obviously greater than 8. Let's subtract something like 2 from both sides. 10 minus 2 is 8. 8 minus 2 is 6. So nothing happened. So what happens to the inequality when we add or subtract the same number from each side? Nothing happens to the inequality. How does it look when we're solving linear inequalities that just have one variable? Well, we want to isolate this one variable so we can get a better idea of its solution. Let's isolate it by getting rid of this minus 5 here. So plus 5, plus 5, both sides, gives us 3x greater than 9. And we want to divide by 3 on both sides, divide by 3 on both sides x is greater than 3. That looks much easier than the original question. We want to graph the solution on a number line. Now think of this, we have one variable, and so we want to graph this in one dimension. So a number line represents one dimension forward, back, one dimension. So here we got 3 here, and I'm going to leave an open circle, and x is greater than, so going this way. So that's how our solution looks on a number line. Example 3 is the same idea. We want to solve this inequality and graph it on this number line. So first thing, let's get rid of the 7 here by subtracting 7 on both sides. And that's gone. Negative 14x is greater than 21 minus 7 is 14. Now, we want to divide away the negative 14. Right now, it's negative 14 times x, so we want to do the opposite operation, which is divide. And we got x left on this side. And because we divided by a negative number, we need to flip this inequality. So x is now less than negative 1. Now, on the number line, we find negative 1. We'll put an open circle because we're just less than, and we want an arrow going this way. 
Now that's not the only way we could have done this. Some people would do some different things. So let's look at some different algebra steps that you may have done. When some people look at this, they say, well, this one's minus and I don't want minus in the end, so I'm gonna add this, get rid of it now. And I'll add it on this side as well. So that cancels there. All I'm left with on this side is seven is greater than 21 plus 14x. Now we need to get rid of the 21, which leaves us with negative 14 is greater than 14x. And last step, divide off the 14, but this time we don't need to flip the inequality because we're just dividing by a positive number. Negative 14 divided by 14 is negative one is greater than x. And these might look different, but they are in fact the same. The x is on the smaller end and the x is on the smaller end. So saying x is less than negative one is the same as negative one is greater than x. Now we want to solve linear inequalities that have two variables. So they can be written any way you want. They could be written in something like a slope y-intercept form or maybe a slope point form or just some non-standard way. But as soon as we see that there's two variables here, then we need solutions that have an X and a Y component. So there'll be pairs of numbers that will be the solutions. Just like before, there's gonna be infinitely many, and so we can't list them out. So we're going to leave it as an inequality once we solve it into a nice form that we like, or we're going to graph the solution onto the Cartesian plane and shade the region where the solutions are. This is gonna be called the solution region or the solution area. Remember that Example four, we want to graph the inequality to illustrate the solution area. We see that we have two variables, x and y. Now, if we have two variables, that means we have two dimensions, x and y. So it fits on the Cartesian plane. It doesn't fit on a number line anymore. This isn't in a very convenient form to graph, and so we want to solve for y. So how about minus 4x on both sides? will give us 2y is greater than or equal to negative 4x plus 10. Now I slid the negative 4x in front of the 10 just so that it looks more like our slope y-intercept form, which is easy to graph. I'm going to divide both sides by 2 to give me y is greater than or equal to negative 2x plus 5. And now it's in very close to our slope y-intercept form. Now our, our y-intercept is 5 and our slope is negative 2. So that means down 2 over 1, down 2 over 1. And I only need a couple of points, but I'm going to draw a bunch here just so I have something to follow as I'm trying to draw this line. So there's two parts to this. There is the y is greater than or equal to. And I just drew the equal to part. Now I need the greater than part of this inequality. So we need all the y values that are greater than. So we look at the line and we want all the y values that are greater than it, like that one and 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 that one. So basically everything above this line so we shade above the line to show that that's our solution area. And all the coordinates in the shaded region here should make this inequality true. So step one was solve for y. Step two was if it's greater than or equal to or less than or equal to, then draw a solid line because we have that equal to part. 
If it's only less than or greater than, then draw this boundary line dotted so that we don't actually equal it. And that's similar to our open circle on the number line. We can get infinitely close to this, but we won't be touching it if it's dotted. Next is we shaded the appropriate area. So if it's greater than or greater than or equal to, shade above. If it's y is less than or less than or equal to, shade below. And that's after we've rearranged the equation into a convenient form of, of isolating for y. Now the last thing we might want to do is use a test point. We can see if we've shaded in the correct region. So when we look at the graph, we would like a test point that is in the solution area if we want it to work. So 4, 4, for example, should work. It's, it's well within our solution area. It should make that inequality true. So let's give it a try. So we're going to test 4, 4, which is in the solution area. So we'll put 4 in here for x and 4 in here for y. So that's 16 plus 8, which is 24. And we can see that 24 is definitely greater than 10. And so this inequality is true. So this test point is, in fact, in our solution area. And it's a valid solution to this inequality one of infinitely many. Example five, we want to graph this inequality. So let's uh, subtract 5x on this side and subtract 5x on this side. Negative 20y is less than negative 5x. Divide both sides by negative 20. Now, if you want to do the algebra steps differently, that is perfectly fine. Y is, now, we divided by a negative, so we've got to flip this inequality. So it was less than, now we've got to do greater than. Negative 5 divided by negative 20, it's 1 quarter x. Now we've got it in a nice form. This is actually slope y-intercept form. Our slope is 1 quarter, our y-intercept is 0. Now there's a invisible plus zero here. We don't want to write it. It's unnecessary. We know it's plus zero if there's nothing there. So our y-intercept is zero and our slope is, remember this is rise in the numerator and run in the denominator. So a rise of one, a run of four. Rise of run, one, run of four. Now I go off the graph here, so maybe I'll draw another one on this side. I could do the opposite, so instead of up one over four, I could go down one and back four. Now I'm ready to draw my line here, but when I look at this inequality, I don't have the equals part. I'm just y is greater than. So here's where we need to draw the dotted line here, because I don't want to actually equal. And y is greater than, so I need to shade above the line. There we go. And that's my solution area up there. I could pick any point and test it here. It should work. If I put, picked any point down here and tested it, it should not work. OK, time for something different. We have an inequality shown on the graph, and we want to write the inequality shown here. So the things we need are slope, definitely, and we could use a point. We've got a couple of those. We also have the y-intercept, so we could just use that. Now the slope is rise over run, so let's see how much we go up. One, two, three. So we rise three, every time we go over one. So rise over run is three over one. And we'd never leave it like that. That's unnecessary to write the divided by one, makes it messy. So we don't like to see that. So we'll just write three as a slope. And the y-intercept is negative two.
Now we have everything we need to make an equation or an inequality. So we've got y is, before we'd have equals mx plus b. I'm just going to leave this blank for a minute. So I want m x plus b. Now are all the y values under the line or above the line? So we look at every point and we look under it and we say, ah, they're under here. So y is less than. And do we want the line itself? Well, it's dotted, so no, we don't want it. So that's it. Example seven is a word problem. Now Darren is hosting a barbecue. He's decided to budget $48 to purchase meat. That means that's his maximum amount. Hamburger costs $5 per kilogram. Chicken costs $6.50 per kilogram. We want to write an inequality to represent the number of kilograms of each meat that he can buy. And then we want to sketch it on here to show the solution area. So we need some variables here. Let H be number of kilograms of hamburger he buys. And let C be number of kilograms of chicken he buys. All right, now let's start off with the maximum here. That would be 48, 48. And that was gonna be our largest amount. We could be, uh, we could be less than that or equal to 48. So on this side, we're gonna be what we buy and this is be our maximum here. What are we gonna buy? Well, it's gonna be five times the number of kilograms of hamburger we buy plus 650 times C, the number of kilograms of chicken. So for instance, if we bought one kilogram of hamburger and one kilogram of chicken, that would be five plus 6.5, that'd be 11.5, and that works. I mean, we're less than 48 at 11.5. Now let's uh, try to graph this, and some people would solve for C. We've got C on our y-axis here. And if you want to solve for C, that's fine. It will work. Um, for these type of questions, sometimes it's easier to find the X and Y intercepts and then just connect those with a straight line. So that's what I'm going to do here. Let's see how that would look. So 48 equals 5H. What happens if I buy zero kilograms of chicken? Then I will be here on the x-axis, or the h-axis in this case. So I'm gonna find the h-intercept here by putting in zero for c. That's gone, divide both sides by five, and we get h is equal to 9.6. Oh, 9.6, we can mark on here, there's 9.5, 9.6, sure. Let's do the other one. We can find the y-intercept or the c-intercept here. So 48 is equal to five, and this time zero kilograms of hamburger will put us on the y-axis plus 6.5 c. Now this is gone, and we're gonna divide both sides by 6.5, and that's not a particularly nice number. Something like 7.38, four, six, blah, blah, blah. Hmm. All right, well, good luck plotting that. So 7.38, I don't know, there. I'm sure that circle's big enough to catch that point. Now we wanna draw a line in between, and it's a solid line because we are uh, 48 greater than or equal to. So let's draw that as a solid line here, all the way from here down to here. And then where's our solution area? Well, we want 48 to be the greatest and this is um, underneath or less than. So we want all of these values here 
under here. And we don't actually want anything in the negatives, so our solution area is actually bounded by the x and y axes as well. And this kind of makes sense. I mean, the solution area couldn't be up here. That that would include infinitely uh, great kilograms of hamburger, so a thousand kilograms of hamburger. That doesn't make sense for forty-eight dollars or a million or a billion kilograms. It would also be out here in this region. So that doesn't make sense. It makes sense that you can only buy a limited amount here. So can Darren buy six kilograms of hamburger and four kilograms of chicken if he wants to stay within his budget? So let's find that six kilograms of hamburger is here and four kilograms of chicken is here. Well, no, that's outside the solution area. Though it must be too expensive for him. How many kilograms of chicken can Darren buy if he decides not to buy any hamburger? Well, guess what? We've already done that question. It's up here. If we put zero for H, then we get this number here. So he can buy, he can buy 7.38 kilograms of chicken. All right, and last, if Darren buys three kilograms of hamburger, what is the greatest whole number of kilograms of chicken he can buy? Well, let's look at our solution area, three kilograms of hamburger. Now, if we find it here and we go up, you can definitely buy one, two, three, four, five. Now, that looks like five is, is good, but since it's so close to the line, I'll just check that algebraically. So, down here, we will write our inequality, 48 is greater than or equal to, 5h plus 6.5c. And let's put in 3 for h here. And solve this for c. So we can see what's the greatest amount of chicken we can buy. Minus 15, minus 15. So it's 33 is greater than or equal to, that's gone, 6.5c. And divide both sides by 6.5. And we get, let's bring it up here, we get 5.0769, blah, blah, blah. Greater than or equal to c. And so it looks like the greatest whole number that will fit here for C is indeed five. So it looks like our graph was really accurate and we could actually tell it was five. The greatest whole number of kilograms of chicken he can buy. is five kilograms. Now, remember why we're writing this sentence. It's not for my benefit. It's so that you guys remember to put your units, because otherwise most people just end here and they forget to put their units or even forget to answer the question, even though you've done some useful math. So end it with a sentence. Just makes sense. We have solved problems that involved linear inequalities in two variables. There's some homework. Give it a try. Have some fun. Yay! Until next time.